I want to focus in on Jonathan and his reaction to this because it says that he was so upset by this little episode that he refused to eat on the second day. And uh, he, this is just something that is really disturbing him. Who can blame him? Jonathan is devastated by this. And why? Because he loves David. Yeah, he doesn't want David to die. He doesn't want David to have to be on the run from his own father. But it's because he loves Saul too. Jonathan loves his dad. He wants the best for him. He doesn't want to see him devolve into the monster that he has become. And so Jonathan's really experiencing heartbreak on two fronts here. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place, and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today does come from the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be continuing our series, and in case you weren't here for the last episode in the Chaplain's Report, so what's going on here is that David and Jonathan have devised a test, because David is convinced, for very good reason, that Saul is trying to kill him. And Jonathan does not want to believe this. He doesn't want to believe that his father wants to kill his best friend, and, and this is a reasonable thing to not want to happen. And so because of this, they've come up with a little test that on the New Moon Sabbath feast that is coming up, that David's just not going to be there. And based on how Saul reacts, if he's very upset that David's not there, then they're going to go ahead and assume that he really does want to kill them, that he was planning on trying to use this as a way to catch him and snare him so that he could do harm to him by having him come to the, the New Moon Sabbath feast. And Jonathan has come up with a way to inform him of his father's reaction because the story that he's, of course, going to tell Saul is that David has gone back to Bethlehem for the new moon sacrifice to be with his family, and if Saul is totally okay with this and there really is no ill intent in Saul's heart to hurt David, then what he's going to do is he's going to shoot three arrows and he's going to tell one of his servants, go and retrieve the arrow. And if he says that the arrows are basically beyond you, then that means that it's not safe, that Saul's action was, his reaction to this whole thing was uh, very, very upset and angry. And so this is the signal that they're going to use so where David can stay nearby and find out what the results of this are without endangering David's life. And so this is how this whole thing works. It's actually a pretty clever little scheme that he and Jonathan hatch up. So we'll go ahead and just keep that in mind when we're reading the reading for today. That comes from 1 Samuel 20, verses 30 through 34. And it says, Then Saul's anger burned against Jonathan. And he said to him, You son of a perverse and rebellious woman, do I not know that you are choosing the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now then, send men to bring him to me, for he is doomed to die. But Jonathan replied to his father and said to him, Why must he be put to death? What has he done? Then Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him and kill him. So Jonathan knew his father had decided to put David to death. Then Jonathan got up from the table in the heat of anger and did not eat food on the second day of the new moon, because he was worried about David since his father had insulted him. Now, what you just saw transpire is a pretty obvious answer to David and Jonathan's question. Jonathan says, no, David's not here. He went home to Bethlehem, and immediately Saul assumes the worst, and that is that his son is actually lying to him, and David did not go back that he's hiding and trying to protect David, which is more or less true. I mean, Saul's not way off base here. It's 
he he may not be protecting i mean he is protecting him he's just this is actually a test and they're orchestrating it it's not just that he's given him an excuse so i mean saul's not unjustified in assuming that jonathan has basically sided with david over him but this reaction though it is a it is very telling of of saul's intent and the intent in his heart and that's the reason that it was useful for david and jonathan I think we want to take a look at this and just see Saul is so consumed with envy and hatred for David that it actually spills over into his own son. Now, this is a moment of passion, and Saul and Jonathan do still stay, like, amicable to one another later on after this. He doesn't, like, cast Jonathan out into exile or, or hurt him or anything like this. But think about this. In this moment where Saul surmises more or less correctly, that Jonathan has chosen to protect David's life rather than give Saul what he wants. He is so furious, he tries to kill his own son. That is what envy and hatred does to you. It eats away at your very soul to where Saul is so angry that Jonathan will not betray an innocent person to turn over to him so that he might kill him, that Saul's reaction to this is to try to murder his own son. And that's incredible. And if that's not a cautionary tale to us, to what hating another person or envying the kind of fame or notoriety or skill or talent or whatever else that they have, that it can destroy your soul and eat away at you and cause you to do things that you don't want to do. Because once... once Saul really takes a step back and looks at this situation. He decides that he doesn't want to destroy his son or his relationship with his son. But in that moment, he could have ended his son's life. And can you imagine what that would have done to Saul psychologically? I mean, it would have destroyed him. And by the way, we actually see where it kind of does destroy him later on in the story when he, his actions result in the death of, of Jonathan. And so we're actually going to see that a little bit further down the line. But right here, he could have just absolutely destroyed himself if he had succeeded in doing what he set out to do, which was kill Jonathan because of his anger. I mean, just the level of malice and evil that has to be residing into you to want to kill your own child, that is just absolutely astounding. And Saul... I'm sure never would have thought he would be the person that would be willing to do that, even in a heated moment of anger. But he is. And see, that's the thing that's important for us to note about this, too. We may think of ourselves as, oh, we'd never be the person that in a moment of passion or a moment of anger that we would lash out or, uh, you know, engage in some kind of sin. We, we would never be the person that would do this or do that. Just like I'm sure Peter thought he would never be the guy that would deny Jesus. Never, 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 ever. In fact, he says that right before he denies Jesus three times. Not just once, three times. You see, Saul needed a little humility here to understand his own sinful nature and that he is a human being with passions that are capable of this. And he also needed to realize that this sin was going to do more than just the one thing that he thought it was going to do to him. See, sin has a cascading effect. It destroys the whole of a person. And so here we see Saul engaged in the sin of envy against David, and it leads to a sin that is so horrible that his wrath gets the better of him, and for a moment he came close to killing his own kid. That's what sin does to people. But... I want you to notice the contrast and reasoning in these two characters, Saul and Jonathan, that are present in this little episode that we're looking at here tonight. You, you notice how they argue with one another here and what their approaches are? It says a lot about what's in their heart. Because you'll notice that Saul's appeal to Jonathan is self-interest. When Jonathan is like pushing back on his father and saying, well, well, why should David be put to death? Saul's response to that is, don't you understand? As long as David is alive, you will not be king. As long as he is here on this earth, 
then you are not going to inherit this kingdom. My line is not going to be established. He will take the throne from me. Therefore, you will never sit on the throne. That line will not be there anymore. You see, his appeal isn't even, well, I'm your father and you should do what I say. It's, it's not even that. He goes straight to, Jonathan, don't you understand that you won't be king if David is allowed to live? Jonathan doesn't care about that. I mean, maybe Jonathan, I'm sure he's a prince, he's thought about it. It would be nice to be king one day, that'd be, you know, great. But ultimately, he loves David more than he loves the idea of being on the throne. And if it's God's will for David to be on the throne, then Jonathan doesn't want to stand in the way of that. He loves God and loves David too much to allow that to get in the way of doing what's right. Saul wasn't that way. At this point, Saul doesn't care what God wants, he doesn't care what Jonathan wants, he doesn't care what David wants. The only thing he cares about is keeping the power that he has. And that's why he makes this appeal to Jonathan, is because he thinks that Jonathan thinks like he does. Because that's the appeal that would have worked on Saul if the situation were reversed. He, Saul, if someone were to appeal to Saul's personal desires... That would be the way to get Saul motivated to do something. Because Saul's heart is not in the right place. The thing that he wants the most is on this earth, not in heaven. The thing that he cares about the most is Saul, not Jonathan, not David, not anybody else. And that's why he has become the monster that he really is. And you see, the reverse of that is that Jonathan doesn't appeal to Saul's self-interest at all. Saul's appeal is to morality. He knows that his father used to be a good man, a very good man. He knows that some of that little bit of Saul's morality and sense and reason, he knows it's still in there. He knows that Saul's soul is salvageable. It's frankly a very Christ-like attitude for Jonathan to adopt. I genuinely believe that if, if Saul had abandoned this quest to kill David, that Saul could have turned his life around and, and been a good king for the remainder of his reign. But he doesn't. Jonathan understands, and because of he, this he acts upon, morality. And that's why he makes this appeal to Saul. He says, but, but he hasn't done anything wrong. He's done nothing worthy of the penalty that you were dishing out. He is saying, Dad, what you're trying to suggest here would be an immoral action that is against God. See, that's Jonathan's appeal because that's the appeal that would work on Jonathan if the situation were reversed. Because Jonathan still cares about doing what God wants. He cares about God's law. He cares about the law of Moses. He cares about God's direction and his will for his life. Therefore, that's the appeal that would work on Jonathan because of that. That's the one he would use on Saul because he is trying desperately to reach out to the dad that he knows he used to have. Because there was a time where Saul did care quite a bit about what God thought and tried to do what he thought God would want him to do. Jonathan is appealing to that side of Saul that he knows still exists somewhere deep in his soul. And you'll notice it's right after this that the spear throw happens. That's what prompts it. And so, it's interesting here that Saul, he makes this appeal to his, he makes this argument to Jonathan to get him to change his mind, which is a selfish appeal. Jonathan's response to that is, but dad, it's not right, it's immoral. And Saul's reaction to this is, I'm just going to start throwing a spear at him. I mean, if there was a Bible story of a Twitter conversation, that was it. <laughs> I know that's a weird analogy to make here, but think about it. It's actually true, isn't it? Isn't this what we experience on social media all the time? That we see somebody that's just outraged at something and they just uh, launch into some kind of tirade. And then somebody points out, well, yeah, but your logic isn't working here. And beyond that, it's also immoral. And immediately the guy is fighting mad and just like goes all caps. And But that's what just happened here in real life in this little episode between Saul and Jonathan. Saul has no good answer for that. He can't explain to people why he is engaging in this immoral action or why David should be put to death. He can't do that. Therefore, he goes to the 
the very next action that he can think of, which is to kill the messenger, to attack the person that is pointing out that what he is doing is wrong. This is something that, unfortunately, is all too common, and it's part of human nature. The second somebody points out that we are incorrect, we want to just take them out, especially if we don't have a good counter or a good way to explain that, because it shows us for what we really are. What Jonathan just did is show everybody else in the room that Saul is no longer acting in God's best interest. He is not acting like a moral human being. He is not acting like a good king. And Saul, in his anger, strikes out against Jonathan as a result of that. Now, most of the time when this happens in real life, it's a verbal striking out. It's just they start attacking the person. They'll attack their character. They'll start insulting them, something like that. Uh, but in this case, it manifests in real physical violence where Saul actually throws a spear at Jonathan. And I want to focus in on Jonathan and his reaction to this because it says that he was so upset by this little episode that he refused to eat on the second day. And uh, he, he, this is just something that is really disturbing him. Who can blame him? Jonathan is devastated by this. And why? Because he loves David. Yeah, he doesn't want David to die. He doesn't want David to have to be on the run from his own father. But it's because he loves Saul too. Jonathan loves his dad. He wants the best for him. He doesn't want to see him devolve into the monster that he has become. And so... Jonathan's really experiencing heartbreak on two fronts here. He's devastated that now David has to go away and he won't see him again and uh, that he's not going to be able to live around him like he used to. This, this was a guy who he considers his brother and is his brother-in-law. And then on the other hand, he hates to see Saul devolve into this animalistic, instinct-driven uh, person that he doesn't even recognize. But ultimately, it's just hard to see two people that you love at odds. It really is. This is why it's so hard for parents to see their kids fighting with one another. I mean, I've seen parents to when their kids just are nasty to one another. And that happens. You know, brothers and sisters, sometimes we don't always get along. And that's something that's really, really hard for parents to see, especially when the kids are, are adults and they have irreconcilable differences. That devastates a parent. They don't want to see that because they love both of the kids. A divorce is another example of this. The reason that divorce is so devastating for kids, I mean, there's a number of different reasons, but one of the reasons, and one of the reasons it's so difficult, is because the kid genuinely loves both parents most of the time. They love both of those parents, and they don't want to see this happen to them. And that's understandable. To see two people that you love just despise one another. And I know that that doesn't happen in every divorce, but it happens in a lot of them. And so, this is what's going on here, but ultimately I think that the lesson we should take away from this is this is exactly how God feels when we're fighting with each other. Because remember, we're all His children. He loves every single one of us, no matter who we are. And because of that, when he sees people being nasty to one another, backbiting one another, wishing ill on other people, I mean, in politics, which I'm in, you see this all the time. I mean, people literally wishing that someone would die or that their children would die just because they don't like their politics, as petty and dumb as that seems. But think about what that does to God. To see two of his children, two people that he knows intimately in every conceivable way and loves, just attack one another out of spite. And that's one of the reasons, and especially in this, this time of year where we need to be good to one another and, and hopefully remember that we are all God's children and we're all bound together by that, that we have to remember to be kind and love one another because there's a number of reasons to do that, but ultimately as Christians and people who care what God thinks about us, we need to also care about Him and love Him enough to be good to one another because when we're not, it devastates Him. 
So that's going to be our last chaplain's report for the year. Our last show of the year will come back after New Year's Day. So 300 episodes in the books. Pretty excited about that, guys. Thank you so much for the support and the love. We will see you again in 2021. And until that happens, stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media or our business partners. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Video production by Jackson Dean. Broadcast studio provided by Faulkner University. Location studio provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2020. <laughs>